Right. Hi there, I'm Karen Jensen from Teen Library and Toolbox, which, which is a part of the School Library Journal blog network. And I'm here joined by my teenage daughter, Riley Jensen. And we are very excited to be talking with YA author, April Henry. So I'm gonna turn it over to Riley, who you may have heard me refer to as the murder team many times online, because she's very interested in mysteries and forensic science. Um, and she's gonna to talk to April, who is one of the most prolific and engaging YA authors who writes teen mysteries. Not always murder, a lot of missing and suspense thrillers. Um, if you haven't read her, definitely check them out. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Riley. Thank you. Okay, so I know you do like a bunch of research on all of your books. So like, when you're finally done writing a scene that you put a lot of research into, do you go back and have a specialist check it to make sure it's right? I have sent things to people to make sure, like I'll send them a chapter or sometimes um, a whole book if it's threaded throughout. So uh, usually though, I've asked enough good questions that hopefully what I have in there doesn't need very much in the way of tweaking. But yeah, I have frequently if I, especially if I have any doubt that I didn't understand how something worked, then I will send it to them. So people are great though about answering questions. I was just emailing somebody who um, answered questions for a book I have coming out next January called Playing With Fire. And I have some characters in the book after that, no, two books after that, that have hypothermia. And so I asked him questions. So it's nice that, there's certain people I've gone back to over and over um, that have expertise. Like there's a retired cop who's answered questions for me, probably for every book. That's nice. So how long does it usually take to like get all of this information gathered? Uh, I, I do, I'm just in time. So I'll be writing and I'll think, oh, huh, I need, uh, I think these people have hypothermia, and then I research that part. Um, so it is taking place simultaneously with the writing, and right now I'm under contract to do two books a year, so I guess that means it takes me six months to write a book. That's not really true, because I'm usually selling a book on an outline, so work went into it before, and then there's editing that happens after I turn it in, but so, you know, on paper, it takes me about six months to do it. And like I said, I'm usually doing the research simultaneous with, with the writing. Because a lot of times you're writing away and then you'll think, oh, well, like I ask questions sometimes even on Facebook. I'll be like, what would you guys call a cougar or a mountain lion? Um, I think in some parts of the country, it's a puma and there's another word too. So I'll be like, hey, Midwest. What do you guys call it? Do you call it pop or soda? I want my character to think and sound the way they should for where they are. For the record, it's pop and we're from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a map of pop and soda. And then there's a small area where everything is called Coca-Cola. <laughs> I don't understand that. It's fine. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> okay. So like, are any of the stories, like any of the stories in your book based off of like real life events or are they all just like fictional that you came up with? A lot of stuff is real. Um, the book that I have coming out in like a week or less, mm -hmm. The Girl in the White Van, it was like one of my, um, it was like one of my books come to life. There was a, a guy who was a bank robber who got out of prison and decided to become a kidnapper. And so he kidnapped a girl from a tanning place and she was duct taped in the back of his van. She actually managed to open the back door and jump out onto the road when he was driving. And then he came to my neighborhood and he started looking for girls. So girls were saying, hey, there's some creepy guy in a van following us really slow. And he actually was um, stopped by a school resource officer and they had a gun battle and he was killed and in his pocket they found notes where he had written down what a girl looked like what color hair she had what she was wearing where he saw her and then he would rate her on a one to ten scale 
And I read that and I was like, oh my God, it's like one of my books. So, um, so it started with that, but then in real life, because I thought, what if he was, when he was confronted, I thought, what if he, a girl was leaving my martial arts school and he took her, you know, and used her as a hostage. And that was my immediate idea. But as soon as I started doing research, cops will not let you leave with the hostage. They know it's going to be much worse wherever you go. It's not going to be better for the hostage there. So they will do everything to stop that. So I, I needed to make it that he could take her without um, the cops knowing that's what happened. So after that point, it was all research. I did a ton of research trying to think of where you could keep a kidnapped victim. I decided on an old RV and then I went and looked at old RVs that were um, impounded by the city of Portland. I had to pass a police background check to go in and look at them. I talked to a lady who has a blog called RV Life or something and asked her questions about uh, getting in and out of an RV and what's the floor made out of and could you go out through that ceiling vent? Um, so that one started with something real. Run, hide, fight back started with um, the Kenya mall shootings. I watched those and I thought, what if something like that happened in America? And then for the bad guys in the Kenya mall shooting, it was actually uh, Muslim terrorists. I didn't want to do Muslim terrorists. And my dad, when I was in college, was targeted by the posse comitatus. They're a group that, um, really doesn't believe in government and there can be violent. And they, they were threatening uh, to kill my dad. They actually called my dad and told him they were gonna kill him. So I made the bad guys in the book a lot like that. Now for a book like The Lonely Dead, totally made up. Um, other than I used real places and uh, the people, I mean, are real to me, but there's not, that's not from, I mean, there's really, un. Uh, there's not people who can talk to the dead, unfortunately, because it'd be kind of cool, but that's totally made up. So it's a mix, depending on, um, on what I'm working on. The book I'm writing right now, which is coming out in a couple of years, is about teens trapped in a Midwestern rundown motel, kind of like the Ramada Inn version of The Shining, and there's a blizzard, and they're trapped there together, and then one by one, they start disappearing. So that one started with me being trapped in, in a Ramada Inn that was a lot like a cheap version of The Shining. And uh, nobody disappeared though, but I was like, oh, this place is too good not to set this story here. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but it kind of depends on what I'm working on. You have to do a lot of police background checks for some of your stuff, or like, was that just the only one? Uh, no, I, when uh, I was doing the search and rescue books, so, um, uh, for those two books, Body in the Woods and Blood Will Tell, I took classes with the teenagers. So in order for the, um, the county to allow me to be around those teens, I had to pass a criminal background check. You know, you wouldn't want to have some creepy person showing up for classes and hanging out with the teenagers or something. Um, and, and then I, of course, interviewed cops quite a bit. Uh, I interviewed an FBI agent for the girl in the white van. I wanted, I asked him some questions and then I wanted to know what would happen if you tried to taser somebody through it or uh, in the drive-by function with it through a towel, whether you could make it so they couldn't get shocked. And he actually didn't know the answer, but he turned to um, another cop. But I actually found someone on YouTube who was like, I wonder if this will work through a towel. And he actually wraps the towel around his arm and then he presses the button. He's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> you can find the weirdest stuff on YouTube. People film a lot of things they probably should be not filming <laughs> and that are dangerous, like people spraying each other in the face with fire extinguishers or people filming the forest fire that's all around them when you're like thinking, I think you should concentrate on leaving, right. not on filming the forest fire. I mean, it's good that you uploaded it to YouTube, so you're probably live, but... Right. <laughs> anyway time. i actually have a question about the team search and rescue because i do remember reading those books and um it seems like like really they have teenagers go out and search that's actually true that part is not a lie <laughs> the, um, 
the teens, uh, what happened was um, in the 60s, in the late 60s, there was someone lost on Mount Hood and they mm -hmm. exhausted all of their regular searchers. And this guy, Sheriff was like, I wish I had somebody else I could send out there to search for them. And this guy said, hey, I've got a Boy Scout troop. So they sent the troop up and they actually found them. And so from that, the group started. And so it's very a very unusual group in that it's 90% teenagers. Most groups do not allow teens. And if they do, they don't usually go on real searches. And our teens not only can go on searches, they lead searches if they have enough hours of training. And 30 to 40% of what they're called out to do is to work with the cops and do outdoor crime scene evidence recovery, and they also do body recovery. Um, oh. Our friend's kid was doing it, and the very first one she did, it was a real sad case where these Ukrainian people were playing around on the snow, and the girl just slid into a creek or a river or something, and oh. she's gone. And so they were searching for her body, and they were teenagers from ninth through 12th grade. I guess you can opt out if you don't want to do body recovery, but most of the kids who stay in it will do it because they want to go into medicine or they want to go into law enforcement. So um, I remember one time I was overheard two kids talking about the various times they had seen dead people. And then I stood up and I was taller than both of them, including the boy. I was just like, I don't think I could be that hard hardcore in like 10th grade. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so since you like took the search and rescue stuff and like you were allowed to do that, are you allowed to do like other like stuff in like a lab? Like um, any actual lab stuff? I've toured the Oregon State Crime Lab because of contamination issues, they do not actually let you go inside the lab. I mean, that's why like one thing when you watch people on a CSI type program and they're talking over a dead body, nobody would be talking without face coverings because you, as we all know now, you spit when you talk. Right. But of course, they don't want to pay these extremely beautiful actors tons of money <laughs> to be completely behind stuff. So. Um, so I have done lab tours, but a lot of times you are just outside talking to people. But I just, I just did a private tour uh, back around Christmas time. So, um, and it was, it, they, our Oregon State Lab will back up all of the cities in Oregon that do not have mm -hmm. enough, um, they don't have enough people to have specialists on them. So they, they could be just an extra resource or they might be the primary person depending on how small the town is. You know, we, in addition to watching like things like CSI and stuff here, we watch a lot of British mystery shows and it is a difference because in the British mystery shows, you know, before they go do a crime scene, like they put on those full body coverings. They're like, like, yeah, and like hoods and, and everything. And it it does strike me as being slightly more realistic. And I remember like, I'm old enough to remember when like CSI Miami was on mm -hmm. and wow and you know investigated like a bloody crime scene and like the one woman was always wearing like a white pantsuit <laughs> yeah. and heels people joke a lot about the heels like yeah they're gonna run around in heels and and the equipment that you know immediately shot up some 3d picture of a driver's license a lot of that was poetic license and um, there was some kind of cop joke that was going around about how people now expected them to be able to pull fingerprints off running water. They would think there was everything had evidence. And um, although, you know, some crimes are so, a lot of crimes are simple and, and boring and stupid. It's two people got drunk, they got in a fight and one of them shot the other one. And that's why we like our books and our TV shows and our movies to have more complicated things where they're, there's a clever villain and there's a, a sense of satisfaction at the end that justice is served. And we don't get that as much from real life. A lot of times it just still seems stupid when you explain it to them. Yeah, and they were drunk and they got mad. Like, how does that help? <laughs> Doesn't make you feel better. But there actually is a scene in your book where like, there was a drunk person and I was like, 
okay, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that does happen in real life and in books too. So you're talking a lot about like all the stuff you could find on like online. What's like the most disturbing piece of information you found? Everything is online. So one time I was at a coffee shop and I wanted to know if you could tell from the autopsy what kind of knife was used on someone. And by Googling, I was able to find a report complete with photos of real people and their knife wounds. And so I'm like trying to hold my laptop so no one else can see it. And then I'm like, they, it was de super depressing because you're like, man, when that person left their house this morning, they did not know they were gonna end up with a black bar over their eyes and a photo of a knife wound um, in a report someplace. You know, that's not what you expected when you got up in the morning. Um, and it turns out actually you can tell some stuff from a knife wound um, and some you cannot. Like uh, your skin is very, your skin and flesh are very plastic. So they kind of adapt to whatever got stabbed into them. So it's not like your Play-Doh, you know, it's not like okay. you can just exactly see what it looks like. But they can tell like whether it has double edges, and there's a few other things that they can tell. But yeah, that one, I actually have very little trouble sleeping um, when thinking about crime stuff. There's like one photo I wish I'd never seen and one thing a cop told me I wish I'd never heard. But for the most part, I don't get bothered. Hmm. Well, how did, how did you even start this journey like that you were gonna write, first of all, for teens, I'm interested in that as a teen librarian, but also like the mystery thrillers that you write. Yeah. Everything, I should say it was all planned, but it was mostly disorganized. And I had written three books and then um, my, none of them sold. My second one got me an agent, but it didn't sell. And the third one didn't sell. And the fourth book I thought, well, I'm gonna write about um, somebody who finds a long lost painting that might've been looted during World War II, which is something that had happened to my mom's friend. And I decided to make it like a Vermeer. And, uh, or to be, you know, that people think it might be a Vermeer. So I wrote the book. It could have been labeled a lot of different things. It's not a standard mystery. It's not like a body drops on the first page and you try and figure out who did it. I think there's only one person who dies, maybe nobody. And it's mm -hmm. mostly the mystery of what is this painting? And my agent said, I think it will sell well as a mystery. And I said, you could call it a cookbook. I don't care what you call it. I just want to sell a book. And it sold in three days in a two book wow. deal. And she told me if they buy it, they're gonna want a second book with the same character. So start thinking, and I had a vague idea. So when they came to me and said they wanted two books, I was like, what if the second one was this? And they said, yes, and they bought it. Then I had written something like eight, 10 books for adults. And I was reading in the New York Times about overseas boarding schools for teens that um, were run by a former used car salesman and were very, you should go look on my website. I will. Right? Some talk point. There's some articles about them. They were insane. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna do it where a good teen gets sent to this school. Like they would tell parents, you should send your kids here because it's cheaper than mm -hmm. an American uh, boot camp. Well, it's cheaper because it's in some place that doesn't have any rules about how you treat kids. Right. And um, they would say, you can't have any contact with your kids because they need to learn. And if they have contact, it's going to hold them back. And they were very clever. They said, your teen may get, send you a letter. Like sometimes they would bribe a guard to smuggle uh -huh. a letter out. And you might get a letter saying you're, that they're being beaten or that they don't have enough to eat, but they're manipulating you and do not believe it. <laughs> but that was what was happening. So I wrote that and I made it, I thought it was an adult book with a teenage main character, kind of like, um, there was a book I like called Nathan's Run. It's mm -hmm. about a 12 year old who's on the, he sees a, mis a murder and he's on the run. It's a, a book for adults. And so I said, it's like that. And my agent's like, no, it's not, it's a YA. I sell tons of YA. And so uh, it got bought and then they cut out all the swear words and they cut it down <laughs> a lot. And then I was like, hey, I like teenagers. I, I like hanging out with them. I like trying to turn reluctant readers into readers. Adults who do not want to read simply don't. They don't have to. Teens have to read to some extent. There is a requirement that you read. So I'm like, I want to make some of those people 
come over to the dark side and join us and be a reader. So mm -hmm. I started thinking, how can I do that? Just like shorter chapters and with a cliffhanger, always have something exciting happening. And then I realized, hey, that makes every book better. <laughs> so right. I started writing for teens as well. That's cool. Sounds like a cult. <laughs> <laughs> when you were young, what did you read? Um, I read all the time. That was a joke. Um, when I was 10, I asked for nothing but books for Christmas. You're probably too old to remember the Trixie Belden Mysteries, which um, the Bob White gang, I'm sure it was a syndicate thing where the, you know different people wrote under the same name. Right. Um, I read, I didn't really like Nancy Drew that much. I wanted to read some of her. I read all the time though. My parents put no limits on what we read. So I was reading The Godfather at like 11 or 12 or something. They just figured, hey, you're reading, it's a book, it can't hurt you, which is kind of my feeling. So, um, so I read, I just read everything. I devoured everything. Uh, I think I got to the point in our local library that I had read my way through the children's section. And then I just went upstairs to the adult section and started, um, which was kind of, for those of us who are adults, like Heinlein wrote books for, kids about boys in space with slide rules but his right. adult books were a whole different story and so I remember taking out some of those books and just like <laughs> kind of um, kind of being having my eyes opened a little bit um, but yeah I, my probably one of my favorite books when I was a kid was um, The Silver Crown by Robert C. O'Brien and that's actually still in print and if you have not read it I would really recommend it he also wrote Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim oh, yeah which was like a cartoon movie, but the, the Silver Crown is just amazing. It's a wonderful book. I remember watching the Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, like, I don't know, maybe I was in the fifth grade. Like, you know, it's like a big deal and you're watching it and you're like, what is, what is this? What are you people doing? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of any of these books. It's like one of those cartoon movies where it's just like, is this really for kids? <laughs> We still, he has the best twist in The Silver Crown, which I used in Girl Stolen, where she is on the run. People have killed her family. They, she thinks it's not quite as dark as that. And mm -hmm. um, this nice policeman helps her and she gets in the car with him. And you as the reader are like, no, he is not a nice policeman. So I used a little bit of that in Girl Stolen, where she's blind and someone tells her he's a cop. So I'm the, probably the only one would know that that's an homage to uh, Robert C. O'Brien, but it's totally a tip of the hat to him. Well, nice. Well, in Girl Stolen, that's the one with the girl who- Gets stolen. Is blind. Obviously that part, Riley, but she's <laughs> blind? Yeah. yeah, she's blind. So how do you do something like that and make it authentic? That one, I think now I'd almost be afraid to write that book. I just have maybe some naivete going in and mm -hmm. also maybe with own voices, I'd be nervous. Yeah. But um, there was a real girl in Portland who was briefly kidnapped after her mom left the keys in the car. She's in the back seat. It's the kind of, actually, you see that story about a couple times a year. Somebody right. sees the keys, doesn't see that there's someone else in the car and drives off. And so he, she talked him into letting her go. And then she was on TV the next day. And I thought, wow, what if they had kept her? Is there things you could know or do as a blind person? So... I, um, I interviewed blind people. I, um, I went to the guide dog school for the blind and spent a day there and asked all kinds of questions. I read a bunch of books by people who had gone blind. The real girl was blind from birth, but I didn't think I could. I know some authors have tackled that, but I don't think I could write about what it's like to s never see anything. Like, how do you see the world? Right. So I made her blind in an accident that hasn't happened that long ago. So she's more like we would be if we went blind tomorrow and we're trying to adjust to it. I gotcha. Um, so luckily there's a ton of um, autobiographical books about someone who all of a sudden has to learn what it is like to navigate the world as a blind person. Um, and then I had a blind person read it uh, to see if it was accurate. And um, she actually found some typos that no one else had found because she was having her computer read it to her. So uh -huh. I'm like the only person in the world who is, has a book that's been proofread by a blind person. But um, 
Yeah, so when I wrote the second book for that, then I went back and I talked to people at the um, Oregon School for the Blind again. I'd already talked to them, but I came back. I went to two different self-defense classes for the blind, and one was super hard for me to get into. Usually people will, if I tell them what I'm doing, they will help me, and this guy was very suspicious like he thought, I don't know, maybe because it was real blind people, he was very, you know, caring of him. But he just really almost didn't believe that I was a writer and why did I want to come in and what was my purpose. And um, that was a really interesting class because they were teaching people, um, like if you're holding your phone, maybe that's a weapon. Do you have a bag full of groceries and somebody's following you? Can you shove it in their arms? Um, they were teaching people throws, which was pretty intense. And um, also, I hadn't thought about it, but a blind person who is doing self-defense has to do maybe more disabling. Because if you're a sighted person, you have a much more of an ability to run off and hide and get safe from the bad guy. But if you ha are a blind person and you're attacked by somebody bad, you might need to hurt them more to make sure they stay put and don't chase after you. So. Um, for part of it, there's a guy who runs a program called One Touch, where if someone, the idea is if someone grabs your wrist, you can feel their thumb, and that, and most people are right-handed, and you can almost start figuring out where they are. Oh. And so he happened to be in Portland. Uh, he lives in he lives in London, and he was going to be in Portland to speak at a conference for the blind. And I said, well, can I bring my pages over for this climactic scene? I thought maybe. If you're blind and someone is talking to you and they're holding a gun on you, you could hit the gun out of their hand with your cane, which turns out is a stupid idea and you couldn't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And I came there and showed him my pages and he brought a blind girl and her cane. And so they were like, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that kind of works, mm, that doesn't work. And then they rewrote the whole thing for me on the fly and then they acted it out while I filmed it with my phone and we're in the lobby of the Doubletree Motel and she's, he's on his knees and she's choking him with her cane and people are walking through with their coffee and they're just like looking at us <laughs> and we were all laughing and you can get away with a lot if nobody looks so sad. So right. um, that's a tip if you want to do any crime, just you can get away with a lot if you look like it's all something fun. You know, probably now you could just pretend it's all for a TikTok video and you could get away with it. But uh, yeah, so that, that made that end work. Whereas if I had just used my imagination, it mm -hmm. would have been totally wrong. So a lot of things, a lot of times when I go to panels, I'll see people and one of the questions that gets asked a lot is like, what is the thing that you've searched for that has you on a, probably an FBI watch list? So what do you, what would you say? I think I, there's got to be something with every book, you know, it'd be like, <laughs> I, I mean, um, I, I don't know. I don't think I've searched anything super bad recently. It's more been like, what's the name of that board in the front that you rest your feet on, on a sled? You know, I haven't, I haven't done any really scary, like, uh, how to get rid of body because I'm not right stuff that's that dark. So um, hopefully uh, Hope you know, I probably like look for ideas on how to hide things or look for ideas on how to um, Do self-defense or something like that. I might look for that, but I don't I think right now. I'm probably safe I have looked for like poisons and stuff like that and I'm sure that will get you flagged a little bit David Riley she has a Poisoner's Handbook, and she was, oh, right. before all of this happened, she was telling me <laughs> time about what happens, like, with, you give somebody arsenic. Uh -huh. He didn't ask her out. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is the thing that you put your foot on in front of the sled call? <laughs> okay, so people had different ideas about that. Like, some people said it was called the steering something or other. And then some people called it the footboard. So there was not agreement on even like me trying to crowdsource it. I think, what did I end up calling it? I'm not certain. I did, I did, um, I do have my handcuffs here. It's like, <laughs> I watched a video I on how to get out of those. I took a class 
like four years ago in LA where you learn how to get out of duct tape and rope and zip ties and handcuffs, how to, what to do if you're being followed, how to make fake ID, um, how to pick locks, how to steal cars. That was the one thing we didn't practice. How to socially engineer people to get you, them to do what you want them to do. And then the last day you're fake kidnapped out of a Denny's parking lot in downtown LA and no one calls the police. There's guys with ski masks and long guns duct taping you and handcuffing you and shoving you in a van and you're in a super busy intersection in LA and people just drive by you on their way to work and nobody says or does anything. Nobody notices it. So people don't notice anything. What an interesting class though. You don't expect to see something weird like that. When can I do it? <laughs> What? So, um, yeah, so from that class, I learned how to pick handcuffs and how to pick locks. And I've, I've had my characters do that a lot. Or just practical ideas about how to get out of duct tape or rope. That was, it was all super useful. Okay, apparently you can just buy a handcuff key. And like, since most of the handcuffs have like a similar mechanism, you can usually get out of most pairs. I have no idea. I was like, what the heck? The people who are super paranoid, like one of the, the guy who took the class with me, was a firearms instructor, and I'm sure he'll never see this. He was a really odd person, but he always, always in the morning would get up and he had Velcro that he would put a handcuff key on, on the label of, the, in, of his pants inside in the back. And his idea was that, like, but I was like thinking, who's ever gonna kidnap you? I mean, it seemed impractical. And the, the day that I forget to put the key back there is the day that you get taken. Right. I just, it just didn't seem, I mean, the people who offered the class were really super, they were huge preppers, you know, mm -hmm. they believe, I mean, they're probably all laughing because it's, some of it is happening, you know, they've got their PVC pipes buried in the woods full of money and guns and, and MREs and they're ready to go. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> you had to kind of just put up with. Like, I don't think I was on the same page in terms of beliefs as them, but what they taught was super interesting. So I just tried not to have but any conversation. storing toilet paper? Because who knew that was the thing that we would need? Yeah, yeah, that's true. They didn't say anything about toilet paper. I'm sure they would improvise something with, I don't know, noxious weeds or something. Yeah. <laughs> we binge watched, I think Chuck, and they said the show Chuck about spies and stuff, they said you have to break your thumb to get out of handcuffs. You can usually just use a shiv. Yes, I also carry a shiv. <laughs> well, if you say, well, that'll work. See, handcuffs, handcuffs, like, they're just, they're simple. They haven't changed since 1912. Peerless did this swing through ratchet. So this one's double locked. There's a little button on the back of a handcuff key and you press there's a little tiny hole back here and you press that in. But with a single lock one, it just swings through over and over. And um, the cop is gonna double lock it because you might hurt yourself if you're wiggling around and that cuff is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. But if um, the idea that in a class that we took and most of the YouTube videos don't even talk about that second lock, but if it's only locked with just one, then, um, you can just put in a flat piece of metal and it will undo the cuff. So this is what they show on the YouTube videos and make it look super cool. So if this is like part of a, those snappy barrettes, those cheap ones. Yeah. So if you broke that off or you had, um, I see flat metal on the ground all the time when I'm running. If you pushed it in at the same time as you pushed in the ratchet, it catches the teeth of the ratchet and it pulls it out. But they don't, like I said, the videos never talk about what if somebody double locked it. You know, you're not, it's, you can pick your way out of here because like you were talking about handcuff keys are super simple, but to pick your way behind your back and they are cops or usually will put the holes facing up. Maybe you, cause you're young and you might have more wrist flexibility, but it's very, very hard. They make it look easier than it really is. So I always have my characters not have that second lock because I don't think, maybe if they were in front of me. And sometimes people are super flexible and it doesn't seem to be 
a thing about how big your hips are or anything, but people can sometimes step over their handcuffs and put them in front. And that's way easier because you can see and also you can use it more as like a weapon. But I can't do it at all. But my daughter's friend, she, I, we were playing around with them and I had her hand, she had her hand, hands cuffed behind her back. She actually was wearing high heels and just stepped back through with no problem. And all of a sudden her hands were in front. And I was like, how do you do that? I don't even understand. I couldn't, I, if maybe I was going to die and I was lying on my back or something and I somehow scooch him down past my butt, but it would have to be like so dire <laughs> that I don't think, I don't, I don't think I could do it. I don't know, but I really just never thought in my life I would be discussing how to get out of half handcuffs with uh, April Henry. So this is the like best moment ever. <laughs> if you ever watch a movie where there's a lots of movies where some poor girl's chained to a pipe in a basement someplace yes. in an old house, and I watch her and I'll be like, you could get out. You could break your glasses and use that wire. There's probably something flat or wiry in your glasses, your underwire bra. Maybe you could do something with your zipper pull. Maybe you, there's something on your shoes. There's something on the ground. I would not be the girl. I would not be just whimpering on the pipe. I would, I would get out. I would make sure that I could get out. <laughs> I would break handcuffs. <laughs> Whatever. Sure. <laughs> Um, I know she asked you about doing lab work and stuff, but have you ever like been like on a police ride along or been in the police car? Yes, I've done two police ride alongs. One was very low key, um, where they, uh, it was in a place called Hortonville, which is about as big as it sounds. And the guy spent all uh, his shift on the side of the road running plates that drove by in case they belonged to somebody who had an outstanding warrant. And spoiler alert, they did not. Okay. At one point, we had a prisoner in the back. It was a kitten because he doubled his animal control. But then the prisoner escaped, but then someone found him again. And then the guy who was the, sh the, the chief of police had a farm, and they would take them out to the farm. At least that's what he told me. I hope it was true. <laughs> so, um, And then I did another ride along. Uh, last year sometime with a police officer in Portland who is actually named Tequila. So uh, I guess there's a story about her conception <laughs> that involves Tequila, but she, um, that was much more active and uh, we dealt with a lot of people. Uh, there's a, it makes me understand right now, like um, talking about changing the funding of police, most of the people she dealt with were mentally ill. Mm -hmm. like just having issues you know like they're mad and people are afraid they're gonna get violent or something and then mm -hmm. um we dealt with uh she used to work in drugs so she was very aware of people and she'd point out things that people would do like sometimes people have multiple air fresheners in their car because they've heard it confuses the drug dogs but it doesn't but okay. they think it does so they'll have a like eight of them hanging from their rear view uh, mirror. She would notice people who, when she drove by, they would check their pockets. It's called indexing. Like if you have drugs in your pocket and a cop drives by, you just like check them. Like she was looking for people who sold drugs or um, she said people were selling heroin and they'd have it in like balloons in a big gulp. And then if they saw a cop, they would just drink it. And I guess you hope that the plastic doesn't erode as it goes through you. But uh, she was she was really interesting. She was much more lively than my Hortonville guy. What other questions do you also have? Yeah, okay. And so the girl in the white van comes out next Tuesday, right? That's right, July 28th. July 28th. Oh, a date. That's really good. Because who knows when people will watch this. <laughs> yeah. A Tuesday of some sort. Yeah. Tuesday, July 28th. And what number book is that for you? 25. Nice. <laughs> Very Guys, nice. now I have to like count. I have to like go, wait, what is it? Because I'm kind of confused at this point. I'll have to go back and add up all the different books to see. Excellent. Um, this has been a great conversation and we really appreciate your time. Super and fun. Also now apparently she wants me to go buy her handcuffs so she can practice getting them. <laughs> yeah, I hate to say it, you can buy them um, at that place that starts with an A. Yes. I'm probably confused, but 
Yeah. Yeah, they, I, I was surprised. You can buy stuff. You can buy you can buy human zip ties on there and handcuffs, and um, you can buy if you really want to get into it. You can get um, like locks and lock pick sets on there, and you can also get cutaway locks. So, um, like if you wanted to practice your lock picking, a cutaway lock looks like that. And then you can see what you're doing with your pick because you can watch those pins go up and down. And um, there's a similar thing with a handcuff. It's just one handcuff and it's see-through and you can watch what's happening. So I kind of got into it for a while. <laughs> for research purposes. <laughs> for research purposes. I just, I, my husband was calling me Rain Man because I would sit there and try and unlock it. I would have my hands cuffed behind my back and I'd try and undo a double lock over and over again. And he was like, just stop obsessing over it. I was like, but I can get it. I know I can. One time I was trying to practice and I was in a hotel room and I had the key on my knee and I was like, this isn't working. And I went to get the key and it bounced off my knee and it went way far underneath the dresser. And I, I was like, I, tried, I got down, which is really hard to do already. And then I, I was like, I just thought I'm not going to walk up to the front desk handcuffed and ask them to go get this key. So I was like, through sheer stubbornness, I got the key back. <laughs> well, that would have been a great story. Like, I had to go to the front desk and be like, I locked myself in handcuffs. Yeah. Don't worry. It's for research. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a writer. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I'm going to take a moment and end this recording. So let me uh, take a moment to say thank you very, very much. And no, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs>